Let's do some examples involving Slater's rules and the atomic size of the element. Let's keep in mind that as the effective nuclear charge goes up, the size of the element goes down. So we're going to investigate the second row. I already mentioned to you that the atomic size tends to decrease as we go from left to right, and we're going to try to see numerically how that happens. So we're going to calculate the effective nuclear charges of each one of these elements, starting from lithium with an atomic number of 3, going all the way to neon with an atomic number of 10. Alright, so what we need to do is first write out the electron configurations of each one of these elements. For lithium, that's 1s2, 2s1. For beryllium, same thing, but now we have 2s2. For boron, on top of 1s2, 2s2, we add 2p1. And then we go to 2p2 for carbon, 2p3 for nitrogen, 2p4 for oxygen, 2p5 for fluorine, and 2p6 for neon. So this is the regular electron configuration. And because everything is going in increasing order of n, and within the same values of n, we are going in increasing order of L, which is to say that we go from S to P to D to F, we are basically okay with the second portion of Slater's rules. Uh, what we do now is we group the S and P's of the same energy level together. So notice that I have here the 2S by itself, 2S by itself, 2S to P now grouped together once we have electrons in the P orbital. So we have three electrons for boron in the 2S to P group, four in carbon, five in nitrogen, six in oxygen, seven in fluorine, and eight for neon, all for the 2S to P group. All right, we're going to concentrate on the valence electrons. In fact, from this point on, all the calculations we're going to be doing are going to revolve around the valence electrons of the elements in question. And um, the chemical properties, as I mentioned in the previous lecture, are dictated by the valence electrons themselves. So focusing on the valence electrons is not only a simplicity to this type of um, approximation, but also a direct corollary of the fact that they are the ones that will dictate the chemistry. So we just focus on them, period. All right, so we're going to calculate the effective nuclear charge for the 2s to p group for every single one of these elements. All right, so we start by calculating the shielding constant. And in each case, since we're concentrating on the 2s to p group, we always have the 1s2 group to the left. And the 1s2 group is of an energy level lower than the 2s to p. So we use the shielding constant of 0.85 for all the electrons present in the 1s. And there's two electrons, so notice that each of these elements is going to have that 2 times 0.85 because they have the same overall um, electronic configuration. Now the difference, of course, is going to lie in the 2s to p group. There is a very amount, a varied amount of electrons in the same group. Now here's where you have to be a little bit careful because what you have to do is, yes, use the 0.35 constant for the same group electrons, which now we're talking about the valence electrons, but you multiply the 0.35 by one less than the number that you see up here for the group. So for beryllium, we have two electrons, we multiply 0.35 by one. The lithium, we only have one electron in the 2s to p group, so we multiply 0.35 by zero, meaning that it cancels out. For boron, we have three electrons, so we multiply the 0.5 by 2. For carbon, we have four electrons, so we multiply 0.5 by 3, and so on and so forth. Uh, now, that's not to say that for the groups that are farther to the left than the ones that you're considering, you get to subtract the value up here. We had two electrons in the 1s, so we still multiply 0.5 by 2. So this business of subtracting one electron from the value you see on the group only applies to the valence electrons. Okay, don't do that for any other group. Now what's going to happen is that you're going to multiply all of these numbers together. 2 times 0.85, which will be roughly 1.7. And then you multiply 0.35 by whatever number it corresponds to. Once you add them all up together, you're going to find out the values that you see here on the, on the slide. 1.7 for lithium, 2.05 for beryllium, 2.40 for boron. 2.75 for carbon, 3.10 for nitrogen, 3.45 for oxygen, 3.8 for fluorine, and 4.15 for neon. What you do now is you subtract each one of these values 
from the atomic number of the element. And in this case, we're looking at different elements, so the atomic number is going to change for each individual element, right? And that's why I wrote it here as a subscript to the left of the element. That's the atomic number. But you guys will probably have to look at the periodic table when you start doing problems of this kind to find out what the atomic number of the element is. So lithium is 3, beryllium is 4, boron is 5, carbon is 6, nitrogen is 7, oxygen is 8, fluorine is 9, and neon is 10 in terms of the atomic numbers. So for each one of those values, we subtract the corresponding shielding constant. So we have 3 minus 1.7 for lithium, 5 minus 2.40 for boron, 3, uh, 9 minus 3.8 for fluorine, and 10 minus 4.15 for neon. And when you carry the subtraction, what you find out is that the effective nuclear charge of lithium going up till neon basically increases. The effective nuclear charge goes from 1.3 to 1.95, then it goes to 2.60, oh, then it goes up to 3.25, then up to 3.90, oh, up to 4.55, up to 5.20, oh, and ending with 5.85. And what you basically see is that because the effective nuclear charge is increasing as we go from the left portion of the periodic table to the right portion of the periodic table, this is basically telling us that the size of the atoms will decrease because the more effective nuclear charge the valence electrons experience, the greater the force of attraction is going to be between the nucleus and the electron. And that effect alone will cause the electron to get closer to the nucleus. So this idea of getting a numerical value for the effective nuclear charge is actually kind of important because it allows you to make that judgment call. And now you have a method to show people and say, yeah, this is the real reason you are decreasing the size of the elements as you go from left to right. Mind you, the experimental values we got for fluorine and neon in the table were actually higher. And that's because experimentally, we can't look at fluorine and neon exactly the same way as we can for lithium up until oxygen. So that's more of a technicality issue than a real uh, change in the trend. Uh, if we had the possibility of having compounds of neon, or more compounds of fluorine, we would actually see the trend following the way we are predicting right here. All right, let me give you one more example. Let's take a look at aluminum and gallium. The one thing I want to point out here, which is kind of interesting, is that I said at the beginning, when you go from top to bottom, the size of the element increases. And yet, when you look at aluminum and gallium, the size actually decreases. It goes from 1.43 down to 1.22. So I want to see if by calculating the effective nuclear charge, I can um, explain this discrepancy in the trend. All right, and so we basically start by writing out the electron configurations of aluminum and of gallium. We have 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p1 for aluminum, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, and 4p1 for gallium. And in case you're wondering, yes, you do have to write out the entire configuration because you need to see how many electrons are present in each individual orbital to apply Slater's rules. So using the noble gas notation is not, is not going to help you out here. All right, now, uh, notice what I did right here. For gallium, uh, here's where the second rule of Slater's rules applies, because we want to be going up in increasing order of principal quantum number, meaning that all the three should be grouped together, followed by all the fours, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But in the electron configuration, the 4s2 comes before the 3d10, so over here, we're going to swap that order so that we go in increasing order of uh, principal quantum number. All the threes come first, all the fours follow, and you go from S to P to D within the same energy level. Then you group S and P of the same energy level. So now we have eight electrons on the 2S2P group, three electrons on the 3S3P, eight electrons on the 2S2P, eight electrons on the 3S3P, and three electrons in the 4s, 4p of gallium. Okay, so that's the second thing. Once you get it in this format, you can start applying Slater's rules to the problem. And we focus yet again on the valence electrons, which for aluminum are the 3s, 3p electrons, and for gallium, it's the 4s, 4p electrons. Always the group to the farthest right. All right, so now we're gonna apply Slater's rules, which once again, I give you the smaller format over here. Uh, 0.35 for any orbital other than the 1s, as long as you're in the same group. Uh, 0.85 for groups 1 principal quantum number um, less than the one you're looking at. 
and then 1.04 elements farther out. Since we're looking at the 3s3p and the 4s4p, we're actually going to be dealing with the first column, the sp column in the set of rules. All right, so as far as calculating the shielding for aluminum, focusing on the 3s3p, we have three electrons in that group. So out of those three, two will be shielding the third one. So you multiply the 0.35 by two. Then you have a group to the left, which is of lower energy uh, level, and you have eight electrons. So the eight gets multiplied by 0.85 as depicted by the table right here. Then you have a group that's even further to the left with two electrons. So those are shielding completely. So those two electrons are multiplied by 1.0. And you do the same thing for gallium. Uh, you have three electrons in the 4s4p, which is the group you're calculating the shielding for. So you multiply 2 by 0.35, one less than the number you see here. Then, if you look to the left, you have the 3D orbital with 10 electrons, but what you're actually looking for is not necessarily the 3D10 or the group to the left, but rather the group that is got one less principal quantum number than the one in question. The one that we're looking at is the 4S4P, so one less than that quantum number is the, three, the energy level 3. So the 3S3P and 3D will count all together. So you actually have 18 electrons shielding with 0.85, um, with a value of 0.85. And after that, any groups that are further to the left, you just count them together. You have 2 plus 8, which will shield completely. So you have 10 times 1. Multiplying all the values together and adding them up will tell you that the shielding constant of aluminum is 9.50 and the one for gallium is 26.0. And if you subtract this from the atomic number, which is 13 for aluminum and 31 for gallium, you find out that the effective nuclear charge is 3.50 for aluminum and the effective nuclear charge for gallium is 5.00. And since the effective nuclear charge of gallium is higher than that of aluminum, we predict that gallium will be smaller. So it's kind of interesting that this happens. Now, this process is also known as the scandinite contraction because gallium appears right after the first row of the transition metals, with scandium being the first element in the series. Um, now, as you'll see in future examples, the sticking just with the effective nuclear charge may not be sufficient to tell whether an element will be larger or smaller than another, but we'll get to that on to the next video. So, see you then.